let me say hi to everybody and welcome to today's workshop around DAC, the Data Archiving Guide by SESTA. My name is Maria Kappeler and I work at FORCE in Lausanne, Switzerland for the Data Archive. And I'm pleased to moderate today's workshop together with Gri, Gri, um, we just learned how to pronounce the name. She will present herself later with the correct um, pronunciation. So most of you probably already know SESTA. So just a few words to provide some context for today. SESTA stands for Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. And SESTA is part of the European Research Infrastructure, also known as ERIC. SESTA currently has 22 member countries plus one observer. And SESTA's mission is to provide a sustainable research infrastructure that enables the research community to conduct high quality research in the social sciences, as well to contribute to effective solutions to the major challenges facing society today. To meet its mission, SESTA provides a wide range of tools and services. If you don't know them yet, I would highly encourage everybody to check them out. And now let me present to you the new tool, the Data Archiving Guide, the topic of today's workshop. The SESTA Data Archiving Guide is a new resource, resource developed by SESTA and is designed to provide employees and data archives and repositories with an understanding of the work a data archive performs. The work of the DAG started over two years ago, and the DAG is currently still under development. Today, you will get to know some of the authors and contents for, contents for the already existing and also new chapters. The outline for today you can see on the next slide. In the morning, we will focus on pre-ingest and ingest. We will have two presentations followed by some interactive group work. In the afternoon, we will focus on the new fair chapter, including another exercise, and followed by some fun with a quiz for the glossary. And we will close our workshop with a wrap up of the day and a closing discussion. Some logistical information for this workshop. The workshop will be recorded, but without the breakout sessions. And for the exercise, we decided that we will record them for um, reporting purposes, but they will not be shared. For questions, you can type in the chat during the presentations and raise your hand after presentations. The slides from the presentations will be published on Zenudo. The link to the recording and materials will be sent to participants by email. And as usual, we kindly ask you to fill out the evaluation survey after the workshop to get an understanding of what worked and what needs improvement for future events. And now let me hand it over to my colleague for the second part of our welcome. Thank you, Maria. So my, my name is Guy Henriksen, and I'm working in SICT with, as um, in personal data, data protection service, but I used to be a data manager for quite a lot of years. And probably you don't have heard about SICT, but it's the, the new version of NSD. Um, now I will talk a little bit about the main goal for this um, workshop, and that is for you to get to know the archival guide and become familiar with the different uh, contents, uh, but in a playful and hands-on way. That's why we have exercises, we have a few games and so on. And you will work in small groups and also with some interactive exercises. The additional goal is also to get feedback for the, the um, chapters that we are going to present and you are working with, and also to generate some visual um, results from this workshop that we can use in uh, reporting back to the other authors in the archiving guide. 
and also to create a positive experience for you as participants in this workshop. So this the audience for the for the workshop is the new or newish data managers in archives. So we hope you have a um, a nice, relaxing and a little bit of fun workshop, even if we are going to have you here the whole day. So now I will say a little bit of uh, the first game we are going to play. So you can have a coffee, you can play a little game, and then we start with the presentation afterwards. The first game we are going to do, I will share my screen. So now you should see a word search. So the first thing we are going to do is to find the words that you can see on the right side of this matrix with letters. So if you unmute yourself and tell me when you see a word and then I can mark it here. I can show you the first, one of the first words and then we can start. So I need you to, to uh, either write in the chat if you don't want to have your voice recorded, or you can just raise your hand or just scream out when you see a word. That's okay. We can start with this. I, can I have found here data manager. So then you can see it's marked and the word is crossed out. So. Can any of you see another word that I can mark? Let's see, I have to open the chat. Documentation, so can you give me some hint about where documentation? Ah, I got it. Yeah. Anyone else? Sister, yeah, that's good. Dog, six down. Six down from. One, two, three, four, five, six. I think I need another hint about that. Or I can just do like this. Ah, thank you. Another one. Metadata. Yep. Anyone see dissemination? Let's see. I uh have -huh, findable that I saw right away. Dissemination. Mm hmm. Yep. User condition column one from bottom up. Mm hmm. That's very good. License. Downwards. Third from right. Uh, mm hmm. Mm hmm. Anyone see interoperable? Interoperable. Most right column, second letter down. Yeah. That's good. Duration. 
right from the purple column. Mm -hmm. There. Yep. Position and that you could see third from left. One, two, three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one word left. Anyone find it? Very good, very good. So these are words that we are going to hear more and more during the whole day. So this leads me to introduce the first speaker of today. Ilse will talk about free ingest. So then Ilse, I hand the floor to you and you will give a short presentation about yourself. Yes, I will. So um, I'll start with uh, sharing uh, the screen because I would argue that um, uh, says the data archiving guide perhaps uh, well what i'm uh, is more and what i'm going to tell you is more important um, than uh, who i am but um uh, i've been uh, working for a swedish uh, national data service um, snd as data manager research data advisor research data coordinator for about 10 years and i've been part yeah and of uh, the data archiving guide team responsible for um, structuring up and providing content for the Preingest chapter. So that's about it. And uh, I've got the background in uh, quantitative social science. So it might be that um, the examples I will be mentioning will most probably come from this area of studies, uh, this area of work in data management. That's about me. And then, uh, yes, the most important thing today, actually, uh, that says the data archiving guide and pre ingest. So um, I think the most important, so the first thing that's important to do is to set it in the context. Because pre ingest, when you see, you hear the word pre ingest, so you might think like, yeah, it's. Um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a concept, but what does it, does it mean? What does it cover? So, the first thing I think is for the, um, even if you know the concept, so you might wonder what ex what exactly does it cover because it can have different meanings in different contexts. So, the first thing to think about is the scope. Actually, so you can think about uh, the pre ingest or uh, as of everything that becomes before data has been data is accepted in the data archive so from early contact to data provider to the data transfer uh, and acceptance in the archive uh, so it's basically everything that happens between before uh, the oies model open archiving information systems model that many data archives use uh, in um, you're know, organizing their processes. Uh, so it's like, um, and this um, OIS model usually starts with something called ingest, so pre ingest. It's like everything that happens before. So it can be looked at in both this very broad um, perspective, like everything, be 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 everything that starts with the first initial contact with the researcher, a data provider to the data, data transfer. Uh, or you can look at it as just some actions or some things that you do before you ingest data in the system. So it's like two perspectives. The first one is like broader, the other one you could say is a bit narrower. 
And then you could also wonder if we are talking about the process processes uh, themselves uh, or um, in a theoretical perspective or we uh, which we have not uh, we are basically focusing here on accumulated best practice and acceptable solutions so it's not like something that um, is a must i mean there are uh, basically it uh, this chapter of focuses on a couple of principles you should follow and what solutions you could use the target groups uh, for whom this chapter is written, I guess it's you, it's new staff of social sciences data archives or staff of new social sciences data archives that know about the principles, but would like to know, to have the know-how, how to work with um, things. As the structure is uh, basically timeline based, uh, rather what you could say chronological, we've tried to structure the the um, information in that way, uh, but not entirely. Uh, you will see that. And uh, what is important is uh, if you think about the DAG chapter on praying just in context is to think about the relationships it has with other um, other resources. So um, like uh, data management expert guide, which is basically targeted to researchers and a data says the resource directory, which is targeted to data archives uh, and con and includes lots of uh, valuable um, practical examples of documents, uh, workflows and so. Yeah, so what does, uh, what should I tell about the the pre-ingest or what does DAG tell about pre-ingest? So here you see a picture of um, uh, OYS model. So it's, uh, as I said, open archiving information systems model, which is used by many archives to structure the ways they work with data. And it usually starts with a producer uh, submitting uh, a, a, a submission information package or data and documentation to data archive, uh, which then starts ingest procedure. But uh, to be in order for the ingest procedure to be started, so um, the data has to. You, you first have to have the data. You have to have it in a reasonable quality, um, and there is quite a lot of work you have to do before that. So. Um, Pre-ingest basically in this chapter means that you that we cover um, the outreach and support activities to researchers to find data to support them in producing better quality data. There's the way how data submission process is organized in archives. It can be different ways um, that differ from depending on the resources archives have. Then we look at um, review and appraisal so what's that what we've got what quality does it have does it y'all you know, can be accepted uh, is it okay is it in in line with our data um, acquisition policy for example and then what do we do when how do we accept or reject the data so outreach and support so this is a very broad category that can really well that incorporates basically two uh, two major activities. So first one is focus on identifying localized data, which can be done in different ways, like systematic data in inventories, uh, which you could do in an institution. You can rescue data in danger. You can try to acquire a data set, but you've got lots of requests for. Um, then it might involve uh, advocacy for data sharing as well, uh, that you should uh, try to convince that it's not, it's, it's, it's um, going to give you more benefits and opportunities rather than, um, rather than uh, create risks for misuse and misappropriation of data. Then uh, you might involve also negotiation of data sharing, uh, like uh, the, very many people who are willing to share their data. They often have uh, concerns, but what about these variables? What about this sensitive part? Uh, but if somebody else is going to publish on my data before I do, so then you can discuss the data access levels, like 
not everything is really downloadable. I guess you know that, but the, the researchers don't do it, do, don't, and often it's important to tell that to them. Uh, embargoes, you don't have to publish everything at, at the same time, and uh, they can have some embargoes, for example, like some specific variables or so. And then as well, what format and what documentation should accompany data? It's also usually time consuming to do this. So yeah, in this negotiation phase, you discuss it with researchers, what's absolutely necessary, what's acceptable, what's optional, but good to have. And then there is the more general activities of support and consult support and consultation, like uh, general RDM training and consultations to data archives. So all this is, something that you could do as a part of pre-ingest with a hope uh, in some future get good quality uh, data submissions. Send the, the submission process. So uh, yeah, it just seems so easy that you have the data package traveling from one computer to the other, but perhaps it's not, but there are things that you could do to make it easier, make it better. And one thing is to inform the depositors on everything, on submission requirements, main steps in the process, instruct, give them clear instructions on how to proceed. And of course, if it's a small data archive and then you know the uh, depositor pers personally, so usually it's easier. But if it's a bigger uh, operation or it's scaling up, so it's very good to have very detailed instructions uh, on how to uh, on the web page and even then you will certainly guaranteed get questions but it's important to to make to, to, for the process to run smoothly it's important to inform then you should ensure the data transfer in itself whether it's like um, it has to be an acceptable solution for the data whether it's like sending the data package uh, via a, a secure server or is it via email or is it via cloud solution there are lots of solutions but you have to be aware of of what works and does not work for the data so yeah just you have to think uh, what date are you your what date is your archive accepting and then um, if the solutions you have are acceptable for example we very in s and d's often get questions well we have such a huge data file we can't upload it in in the system that you have now so we have to look for other specific solutions so yeah and then you have to administer incoming data and again if it's a small operation it's not a problem uh, you can have a a simple log on Excel file, for example, but if it's a bigger operation, so it's important to, to, to know when new data set, uh, new data has come in, uh, you have to be sure that it's assigned to someone. You have perhaps preferably seen the, send a, rep, a receipt to the depositor, perhaps informing the person about um, uh, the next steps, what's going to happen now. Then you usually have to think uh, where to store this submission before you ingest into the system. So usually it's some kind of a temp temporary storage. If it's, um, yeah, and how it's organized, it can be different ways. It can be a disk, it can be a yeah, an external disk or so. Uh, yeah, so in s and so we do use a web system and we have a separate place, separate, uh, separate, um, separate um, area for, um, well, we could say quarantine, but it's, it's like for temporary storage of data before it's in, 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 in um, ingested. Yeah, and when you've got the data, you've saved it in, uh, into a temporary storage. So the next question is, can we accept it and can we ingest it? So, and then you do the controls first. You can't control if it's, um, if it complies to acquisition criteria that you should have in the acquisition policy, or basically if it's this kind of data you accept or not. Then you control the submitted material technically. If there is depositor ID, if it's if the person who sent it in has right to send it in, because sometimes it's like, um, yeah, some yeah if the person's related person sending in if it's a bigger project if the person's related to the project then they are who's responsible and well, who's depositing data if the material material is complete if every if everything's that's described in the material is there you do some technical controls on virus and readability 
but you also focus if data is thoroughly descriptive and what are the if the legal and ethical aspects are taken care of. Can you accept this data has uh, in the way it's been submitted legally, if you think about legal aspects, for example. And then you do the review of documentation. Is there enough context information or not? Or do you need to ask for more? And then all this process happens in a in the corporate communication with researchers, continuous communication. You discuss uh, certainly, well, to some extent also when you do the controls, um, but they lots of controls can be done automatically. For example, reposit depositor ID can be checked for, by using, um, if, if the person is using a university uh, email address, for example, and completeness of material can be used by checksums in a way. If, if it's not changed, then virus and readability can be uh, controlled technically automatically as well. But then uh, in the review of documentation, when you look at the context information, then it's very often that you have to ask for or more and ask for clarifications. It's an ongoing process. It has to be very goal-oriented and often initiated by data managers, proactive and supportive. Yep, and we do it also, you can do it via, via email, but in SND we do it via this online um, interface, but it, it doesn't really matter. It's important that you do it. And that the technical solution is acceptable for your needs. And then the last thing is actually accepting or rejecting the data. The good thing is if you finally come to a conclusion that the data set is of, of um, high enough quality and documented well enough that you can accept it. Then you notify the researchers and explain further steps what's going to happen now. Is there going to be an agreement to sign or um, are there con are they still have will they still have to answer some questions or not you have before um you do accept i i i, rem I know i mentioned in the review um phase that you do look at the ethical and legal questions but before you accept, you have to be sure you have, there is a legal ground for accepting the data. So basically, you have, have to have an agreement in place or in negotiation, like that you know that you have right to accept the data. And then you have uh, to alert the ingest team, which is very important if you have a larger operation, if it's just two data managers. So basically, you know when you move from one step to the another, if it's the same person working with data. But it still might be good to make a note for yourself. Now we've accepted the data, now we work on the ingest phase. And uh, yeah, sometimes it's good to have also to have a checklist, for example, for example, if I've done everything that I have to do in pre-ingest, can I start ingest now? If you do reject the data, so then, uh, yeah, well, it can happen. The data is, uh, well, no, it doesn't have to be corrupt, but it can lack doc uh, essential documentation or, there are some legal issues or it does not actually correspond to acquisition policy. So in any way, you have to inform the depositor and explain the reasons and suggest a more appropriate repository if you can think of some and remove the data from temporary storage. So, and then uh, if you think about further reading and examples, so a good idea might be to look at, says the resource directory. They have um, a chapter, a category that's called um, under digital object management, they have a category called pre-ingest acquisition and they have a lot of materials there. Yeah. And then finally, uh, in the group uh, session part, I would appreciate if you can look at um, three cases. Uh, working with data repositories, uh, developing routes for better quality of data, and organizing, structuring pre ingest activities. Uh, which um, and and look how uh, this pre ingest chapter can help you. What you find um, useful, less applicable, and what's missing. So that would be for me. Thank you. And I see I've. Uh, I've exceeded time for a minute, but perfectly fine, Ilse. <laughs> Thanks yeah. a lot for your presentation.
Um, so currently we don't have any questions in the chat. So just a reminder, you can still type if you don't would, uh, if you don't want to speak, or you can um, raise your hand if you're okay with um, stating your questions question directly. So then I take over. I start my presentation right away. Uh, hopefully I will find the right screen now. Okay, do you see it? Yes, okay, perfect. So first I present myself. My name is Iris Butzlaff. I'm working at Auster uh, since 2018. And I'm mainly in charge uh, in ingest work and some access and preservation tasks I will I also do mainly uh, well during daily work. So I will tell you now how uh, ingest is done in different archives. So that's why you will see some pairing with ILSIS pre ingest chapter. But that's how it is. Uh, archives are working differently and uh, have different stuff or maybe do not have different stuff to divide the tasks. So that's why we cover some same things here. So the chapter in just is structured in the way that I start with topics which need to be clarified before starting with ingest tasks namely the handover from pre-ingest to ingest and different kind of data deposit agreements. Then the main tasks in ingest are discussed, which are checks on metadata and documentation material. And finally, accompanying, accompanying subtasks complete the whole ingest process. For example, how to deal with updates or new versions uh, about the adaptation of workflows if necessary and an exemplary checklist for ingest. So the handover from pre-ingest to ingest is very differently done from archive to archive. So, but in any case, there are checks on completeness of data and documentation material to do and checks on formats on sensitive content and whether the uh, data is encrypted or password protected. And we need to get back to the depositor to, um, to fix this. So what we also do is making backup copies of the SIP and uh, of course compare if the data um, fits the data collection policy of your own repository. The process how you hand over the data from pre-ingest to ingest is done very differently. So some uh, archives have an automatic notification to a software system other archives may just use email so that they can inform the uh, ingest agent that the data is, is there and can uh, be corrected or there may be other forms of notification and also the transfer of data is very differently so <clears throat> these might be uh, that the ingest stuff is able to download the data from a data transfer system or just uh, also like the notification just use email or download it from a server or something. Um, but in most archives it's usual and necessary to keep track with some kind of software of the status of the data. So that can be done by some project management software or some web application or Excel lists. Uh, if you enter the the dark, you can see you find a link to an annex where you see Excel lists how these can look like. <clears throat> so for the data deposit itself, uh, it's the following list that gives examples uh, is an uh, yeah of an, an overview of what kind of data or documentation material might uh, you receive for archiving. And the decision about what may be considered as mandatory or optional can vary from repository to repository. So we consider it as mandatory that there is a signed contract, uh, that we have metadata information. I know this is treated differently from archive to archive. So we want the depositors to fill all the metadata information. I learned that other archives um, complete the metadata by themselves if it's not uh, fully covered 
um, of course, we need data files. We need the code book if it's there, or at least a methods report, or some. It would be good to have some kind of um, instruments of data collection, and yeah, there are optional documentation material as well, like project reports, data management plans. So this is up to the depositor what he or she wants to archive or not. Um, there are different types and formats used in the community. So for quantitative data at AUSA, we realize it's mainly STATA, SPSS, and R, and sometimes Excel or CSV, what is used in the community. And for qualitative data, this is text programs or PDF format. So that is also the reason why we, in the end, convert data to the, to the data, uh, to the formats mostly used in the community so that we can offer different formats of the data. But it is essential for archives to provide a list of the preferred formats so that depositors are informed right away. Um, regarding data checks and ingest procedures, there might be different services or workflows for different data deposit agreements. So this is the case, for example, data checks uh, can be different regarding pseudonymization procedures um, when you think about the openness of the published data sets or maybe the other round the condition of the data set uh, might prescribe the necessary license agreement when you think about uh, un the universe well when for example it's a very sensitive group of respondents uh, that you're dealing with so the open access license agreement aims at the maximal reuse of the data. It is meant to be used by teachers, students, or journalists and the public, but is fully not, but is usually not informative enough for researchers. The scientific use agreements with restricted account-based access aims at reuse by researchers with a scientific interest in the data. And for data under restricted controlled access, an archive member is involved in the delivery of the data. So the data users might be asked to complete and sign a form before they get access. Entschuldigung. Then an archive member verifies the scientific legitimacy of the applicant and then grants access to the data. But there also might occur special conditions for the data, like uh, Ilse already mentioned embargoes, for example. Um, and then there we uh, yeah um, have the question how is data that is not available yet or published under embargo stored internally so there might be different procedures how you deal with it and there's also the question and uh, do you um, store the data in your archive and um, do we reuse it so give access to it or is it for preservation only in our archive, we do not uh, store data for preservation only, but we always give also access to it. But there might be different procedures in other archives. Um, metadata describe available data resources of an archive to facilitate searching for and cataloging of data. And metadata offer a structured and systematic overview of the data resources and contain, for example, information on the authors or keywords on the data. Open and unrestricted access to metadata is essential for effective data use and reuse. So to this end, metadata in general are published under the public domain dedication, so CC0, and may thus be freely and openly accessed and used by the public. So this is why we say metadata is fair, everybody can access it. Um, for other metadata, we use vocabularies. These are international standards set by the Data Documentation Initiative and the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. Um, there are mandatory metadata, metadata items for harvesting, and uh, often there are different languages that are uh, offered. And for, for ingest stuff, we recommend to be clear about free text fields. So do you use capital letters? Do you use British or American English? How do you deal with abbrevi abbreviations? Do you have it in paragraphs or not? Do you use abbreviations or not? Uh, how do you spell names of institutions? So do you use the full name or just university of something? And uh, do you use uh, persistent identifiers and links? 
um, when you check the metadata, you consider if uh, you have received all relevant metadata information. Again, this is different from archive to archive, as I heard. So some uh, enrich the data by themselves and uh, fill in missing metadata fields by themselves. Um, uh, do you maybe have more information on optional metadata fields that you can extract from method reports or something? Um, in our case, for the software that we use to uh, disseminate the data, we realized that the metadata fields should not contain any separators, for example, like dots or commas as thousand separators. Uh, but this depends on the tool you use for dissemination. So, but it is the reason is that uh, it should be easy to harvest the metadata. Um, yeah, are the metadata fields filled in correctly according to the CMM or DDI standards? And yeah, and that there are more questions about own considerations for the maximum of keywords used or things like that. For the data and documentation materials, you do checks on them. So you check on risks for integrity. Uh, is there any um, violation of the GDPR? So is in this case, there are some steps you need to follow that you, for example, remove all direct identifiers and you need to check for compatibility with other formats. Uh, we do also checks on plausibility and we compare data comparison and documentation material. I realized that in some archives, the order of all these checks is done differently. So this should not uh, confuse you, but this order is just to to serve as an example, but it's also always good to have in mind how other how the, how other archives do it, and maybe you can learn from them. So this is why I still kept all uh, mm -hmm. steps here. What we do about the checks, and then you give feedback to depositors. Some other archives don't, so they just do the checks by themselves and the changes. We need to add the DUI and version to the data set. We uh, have a specific file naming and managing of the files. We convert them, as I already mentioned, to other formats in the end. And we need to keep track of the provenance, of course, so what has happened to the data. Uh, and then we can disseminate them, and therefore we use different software systems, for example, Dataverse or Nesta or other uh, systems. I can later show you, you can have a look maybe by your, on yourself on the checklist of general interest procedure, procedure steps in the annex. Uh, again, also, I think, did you have mentioned it, Ilse, on updates and versioning, but it is clear that you need rules for workflows in case you get updates and new versions, and you need to, to make sure that you uh, can ensure reproducibility of all steps you have done. So you need to track steps and for in internal coding and maybe errata files for other users or for reusers that they can understand what has happened. And you need for yourself in the archive be clear about the structure according the, to the OIES model. Where do you treat it in the AIP folder or whatever and SIP? How do you treat uh, updates and different versions? And you uh, need to make up your mind about major or minor version changes. What do you consider as major and what is minor? Uh, sometimes it is necessary to adapt to workflows and processes. Um, for example, things happen and there is a pandemic and then you have a new dataverse and maybe you have fast track uh, procedures to ingest the data and then it is a different workflow than you usually use. So this might happen. Or also, for example, if you get a bulk of data sets in the form of a pre-mortem request, for example, then you might say, okay, this is, you know, in a, in a lower line and we don't need to do a fast uh, ingest on that, but it can take some time and it's not uh, urgent that we have it in the archive. This is an, an image of the general ingest procedure. And again, don't worry yourself if you have a different uh, order of these steps, but more or less, this is what we got from from archives. This is uh, 
this is done usually in in ingest by the by the staff. Uh, and here you can see the checklist I was talking about. Um, yeah, maybe it helps people to see that they don't didn't miss any steps in the ingest, and um, yeah, can can clearly follow that they that they can trace and document all the steps. So this is for the for the duck itself, and like Ilse also did, we developed some questions which also Marielle entered in her in her task uh, you can think about and it's only yeah to think about it or maybe to discuss with your archive colleagues and um, yeah this this will be some questions that Marielle covers later so thanks for listening uh, so uh, thanks for uh, inviting us today. So my name is Kim Ferguson and I work at DUNS, which is a SESTA member. We are the Dutch service provider for SESTA and I'm here with my colleague Maika. Maika, you want to introduce yourself as well? Yes, hi, I'm Maika van Berg and also a research data management specialist. So joining uh, Kim in the same team. I'm happy to be here today. Great. So Mike and I, we are giving you a sneak peek of chapter five for the DACH. It's not there yet. We're working on our final draft and we'll talk at the end of our presentation about how you can help us out with our fin finalization of chapter five. But chapter five is entitled Fair Enabling and Trustworthy Qualities of Archives. So we're going to go into what we mean uh, with the title of this chapter and break it down section by section. And then after we do that, we're going to work through an exercise on a tool that we mentioned in the chapter, as well a tool that has been developed for a previous project called Fair's Fair through Dance. And it's all about becoming aware of FAIR and how it relates to data sets, but we'll give you a perspective that's more appropriate for when you are working at an archive, how you can use the tool with both your users as well as yourself. So with that, well, I've already introduced ourselves. So yeah, we're going to give an overview, a hands-on session, and then questions and wrap up. So I just skipped this entirely. But first we do have a mentee for you. So if we can head over there, and Micah, would you be able to put the link in the chat? Excellent. So I'm going to now switch to Menti. And actually, I'm going to just redo my share here just to be this entire desktop. So the first question that we have for you is which country or region your archive or repository is based. And right now I've hidden the results, but I might be able to just unhide. Oh, no. There. Switzerland. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Slovenia. Okay. We have a good representation of countries that begin with S in English. So that's good so far. And then so for Mike and I, that's uh, the Netherlands. I have Estonia and Norway. Excellent. All right. And let's see. So the next question that we have, now that we know where you're where you're working from, is what is your role within your organization? So we, we let this uh, you fill in whatever you want, whatever best says what your role is. And I can already show results. So Mike and I mentioned our title is research data management specialist. Um, data steward, excellent. Project officer, data archivist. Cool. Research data, <laughs> Micah. <laughs> All right, so so generally a little like a, a data protection advisor well, and data manager. Okay, so we're seeing a great theme of data and working with it. And I would guess as well that a lot of these roles, some of them are more user uh, interacting and some are maybe less so. So how often do you actually interact with your designated community or your researchers or citizen scientists and how often not? That's another way you can think of it. So the next question, the final one, and this is to help us introduce the topic is what is your experience 
with regards to fair, and it's just a scale from one to five. One is very little, what's fair? <laughs> um, I hope no one says that. Um, and then all the way to, I'm all about fair, or at least my work is. So we have two people who I've had a few experiences with it. Someone is all about that fair. And Mike and I will talk about this as well in our presentation is right now we're using the acronym FAIR, but that's just an acronym. Our boss sometimes says it's just a buzzword. Uh, so it's actually the ideas behind it that are more important. And we'll talk about that as well. So most of our, most of our audience, I've had a few experiences with it. Excellent. So I think that's it for this mentee. And I'll just go back and redo my share again. Okay. So what is in this chapter? Micah, I think you will switch over here. Yes, indeed. Do you want me to take over the screen and share or are you good? I'm good. I think you can just say next. Okay. So we'll give you a, a bit of a shorter introduction to this chapter, maybe than the ones in the morning, because as Kim already said, we are working on finalizing the chapter. Uh, so it's not yet live on the dark uh, website, but it will be very soon. Um, we've The chapter is called Fair Enabling and Trustworthy Qualities of Data Archives. And here you can see the four sections in which we divided that up. So we start with the introduction to FAIR, and then we have two sections on enabling and promoting FAIR. So the first one is internally in your organization, enabling FAIR. And the third section is how to promote FAIR practices to your designated community. And then the last section is on trustworthy data archives. So that's where the concept of trustworthiness and trust principles come into play. And we also link uh, FAIR and trust together in this chapter because they're both quite important. Um, well concepts, sets of guiding principles for archives to uh, be aware of in the context of the data archiving guide as a starting point. So on the next slide, you see that in each section of our chapter, we've tried to put in some common elements. So of course, there's information about the topic that the section is on. Um, but then we also try to include examples from SESTA archives in the sections so that you um, can actually see some real life examples of how to implement certain things or how to communicate certain things outwards. Um, then in each section, we put some questions to increase your understanding of your own archive. So we, uh, we provide some maybe exercises or provoking questions that you can bring with you to your own archive to learn more about the state uh, of your archive regarding the topics that we talk about. So um, these are also in each section and we also try to include some expert tips. So these are just some, it uh, can be tools to use. It can be just uh, experiences, tips from people who have experienced certain things and want to share that with the other service providers. So we've tried to make a really well-rounded overview of um, what you need to know as a SESTA archive particularly. So then we move on to the first section, which is the introduction to FAIR. Um, we delve into what FAIR is and its history there, because depending on how long your archive has already been around, your archive has been working on doing good data management long before the creation of the FAIR guiding principles, because they're, well, I don't know in science terms if we could still say new, but 2014-ish is the conception of the FAIR principles and archives have been around for much longer than that. Um, so the idea that archives need to take good care of data is of course not new. Um, but what we saw in the more recent years is that the amount of data grew a lot in the digital age. Uh, and with that, a lot of new archives and also repositories popped up everywhere. And that's sort of watered down some of the good data uh, practices that the archives uh, upheld before. 
um, and also the other stakeholders uh, engaging with the archives. So the researchers, uh, the creation of the role data steward, which wasn't really around before, and all different kinds of stakeholders um, all now needed to be more concerned with data management to take better care of the huge amounts of data that we're creating. And that's when a group of people came together to start thinking on these fair guiding principles um, so that all the different stakeholders know the same things about good data management or an aspect of good data management. Uh, and all the noses are in the same direction with regards of what we're chasing, what's, what's the things that we're trying to uphold here. So fair, uh, I think in this, in this group of people, I don't need to go too deep into what FAIR stands for. If we saw the mentee before, you all know findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Um, so in the chapter, we go into much more depth about the different principles and the 15 actual principles that go with them. Um, that's not for the scope of today. What I wanna highlight about this section today is that we also um, make the comparisons between FAIR and um, open, fair, and the care principles, fair and oasis, all different kinds of terms, because fair is just one term of many. It's not the end all be all. It's not uh, the only thing that archives need to concern themselves with, sadly. There's a lot of other things to also do to uh, make sure that you're doing good data management and long term preservation and everything in between. Um, so that's what something we want to highlight that fair is generally speaking, the, the term that most stakeholders in science nowadays should know about or know about or are being required to know about. Um, so that's why we think it's important to include FAIR here in the doc um, so that even if your archive isn't that explicit about FAIR, you do know that the term is important to know as a person in the scientific ecosystem. So on to the next, and that's the section made by Kim. Yes, so section two really opens up into within your own organization. So within your own archive, within your own repository, how is FAIR enabled? And so the discussion is more, and there's a quote here from the chapter and you can read it, but really what the chapter works on is we surveyed the dog community to ask how is FAIR promoted at your archive? Is there a course that archivists take? Are, is there heavy use of the DMEG, for instance, the accompanying guide from SESTA? But also, of course, that's why the DAH is being created. <laughs> so it's more trying to compile how the different ways that people who begin to work at archives are brought into the FAIR principles, either by name or by concept. As we said, maybe you don't use the word FAIR. And so the other way to do this is by doing self-assessments of your own data archiving practices. And so within this chapter, we talk about two different tools and two examples from SESTA archives using these tools. So one is the um, Fuji, which was developed to be a sort of automated assessment tool. However, there are some things to keep in mind. Not all assessment tools are created equal because not all archives are equal. So sometimes when you have a question over what type of metadata is available or licensing or different types of file formats that are accepted by an archive, it might not trigger the correct response from the FAIR assessment. So, and the second tool is the Wilkinson assessment tool which has also been used by another archive in SESDA. And so we will cover the experiences of using those tools and how they were able to inform at the archive their own practices, but also how they considered what is most important for their field of work. So that's two, enabling FAIR. So that's an inward perspective. That's like, how do we do that within our own organization? And then, Oh yeah, so see, I just, <laughs> there we go. Uh, yes, 5.3, <laughs> promoting FAIR with your designated community. And again, so this is a ch section from that chapter. You can go ahead and read it. And when we had surveyed the different SESTA 
um, archives about how they talk to their designated community about fair, we actually found some variable reactions that we didn't expect, but were very interesting. And we found there was a bit of a dichotomy between are we going to how we would say promote fair? Are we going to train our designated community? Are we going to actively try to educate our users on fair? Or would we rather embed the principles of fair within the process of uploading data to our data archives so that that is entirely out of view of the designated community? That's our job as an archive, not our users' job to worry about. So there was really one, you can do both. You can pick one or the other. I think dance does both because we embed the principles within our process for uploading data and our provenance recording, but we also promote it and we also put on events and we maintain a tool on our website that really tries to teach researchers about FAIR. So, um, but it also fits into this idea of what is the role of the archive to the designated community. And that's a, an interesting conversation that you can bring up within, within your own archive. Is it important that our users understand the FAIR principles and how we are part of their work on making their data FAIR? Or would we rather not burden, and I say the word burden, <laughs> but burden our users with trying to understand the different elements of FAIR when we take care of it? So the... There's the two methods and you can use both. And so when you're promoting, that's things like news bulletins, events, tools, uh, user guides that are actively telling users when you're uploading your data, this is what you get for it to make your data fair, which can be useful for users if they have grant requirements or they want to be explicit about how they're making their data available. And then embedding. So that's more supporting users and just making the open to end process of submitting data be as complete as possible to make the data fair. So that's 5.3. And then I'll go back to Micah for 5.4. Yes. So after three sections of fair, the, the chapter also covers the concept of trustworthiness. Um, and in this, um, we have also include the trust principles, which may be a bit lesser known than the FAIR principles, but are similar in the sense that the concept of trustworthiness was around long before the trust principles were published as the uh, acronym on sich. Um, so we try to focus here on why an archive should be trustworthy, which I is not something we ask in the mentee for you, but I hope that it's something you are also already quite high in awareness of. If you, if you already have some experiences with FAIR, I think trustworthiness, maybe not as explicitly, but runs in the veins of all archives much more even than being FAIR. It's, it's much more related to also the long-term preservation of data, the long-term uh, availability of your services. Um, and in general, just how can you facilitate trust in your archive from your designated community, which will then lead to people wanting to deposit their data with you because they know that it'll be safe and well cared for. Um, and more recently, the concepts of fair and trustworthiness are, are almost always accompanying each other. Uh, and this results in some sort of ultimate archive of uh, unfair enabling trustworthy digital repository where data is being made and kept fair for the long term. Um, and this is uh, clearly displayed for the designated community, for example, in the form of a certification seal, such as Cortra seal, or in a different way, um, by explicitly communicating to your designated community what exactly you do. So for example, you can, again, promote the trust principles or embed them in your processes and have the concept of trustworthiness run through the processes. So in this chapter, um, we also highlight the SESTA trust support because SESTA helps its service providers with being trustworthy, um, with obtaining certification from core trust seal and uh, keeping this accurate and up to date. Um, so that's something that 
is mostly why the chapter isn't up yet because we're trying to be very close uh, collaboration with the SESA trust group here and get input from them um, so that they can uh, communicate in the DAG what it is you should know about their work, what they do, what they offer and how they can help you. Um, yeah, display those trustworthy qualities in your archive as well and then connecting them to FAIR. So I think that's it for, for the sneak preview of the chapter. And as Kim said, we're uh, if you're interested in being an early reader for the chapter, we'll uh, give you the opportunity to do so uh, and we'll be in touch after. Um, but for now, we wanted to sort of shake up the, the afternoon and hour, hour six of today's meeting. I don't know how long you, you've been at it. Um, so we wanted to stop talking as much and be a bit more interactive for you. Um, and this is why we chose to include the FAIR AWARE tool in today's session. This is a, a very a straightforward, simple introduction to FAIR tool. It's self-assessment uh, online. So you answer 10 very simple questions um, with yes or no about 10 different FAIR practices. Uh, and then the real value of the tool is in the guidance text that accompany each question, um, which is where you can actually develop more FAIR knowledge and skills. So with this tool, you can assess where you're at currently, and then also increase your understanding of the FAIR principles and certain FAIR practices and how to apply them to a data set. Um, so this is uh, a tool that we link in the first section of the chapter because it helps introduce the concept of FAIR and it's a way for readers of the DAG in case they aren't as familiar with FAIR uh, to uh, yeah, have a starting point and increase their knowledge. It is mostly aimed at researchers and data stewards, but it is very valuable to use the tool um, for anyone who works with data, either to understand the perspective of researchers, and data stewards, or data depositors, um, and realize what kind of choices they're making in deciding where to deposit their data, but also just as an individual to know a bit more about what's going on and what your archive could or should uh, be explicit about or tailor their services to. So that's the kind of perspective we're taking today. So in the next slide, you see what we're um, aiming to do. So um, we are trying to look at how the archive is presented in the FAIR AWARE tool and what is expected of you as someone who works at an archive to create and maintain FAIR data. So I think, yeah, we have a mentee set up for this because we don't have time to, act, to go through all 10 questions together today. So we wanted to give you a sense of what you can do. Um, and then if you're interested in taking it further, you can, in your own time, continue uh, the other questions that we don't um, handle today. So I've posted the link to the site in the chat if you want to have it open, but I think Kim was trying to do a dual screen kind of thing. To I'm show, working on it. <laughs> yeah, to take us along so that we can see the tool. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's see. So on the left, we will have the, the mentee and you can access that on your mobile or a different window. And then on the right, we have just the Fairware website um, and we'll get the results of the mentee as it happens. I can yes. So if we do a quick scroll through the whole tool, you see that it starts with an introduction of what the tool is. Um, we have this course identification code box in case you want to use the tool in trainings. So if you want to, you can get in touch uh, and download the materials you, you need uh, from the website to use it in your own training. Then we have this section about you, which is just where you fill in what kind of role you have and in what kind of domain you work and what kind of organization. Um, so that's all just descriptives around the tool. So here you can see, yeah, social sciences, for example. And then, 
there. Yeah. <laughs> then you actually get to the 10 different fair questions. So they're organized on letter. So we have a couple for each letter. And like I said, we'll just go through a couple. And the basic of the question is always, are you aware that? And then the question follows and you just answer yes or no. So that's the core of what we do. But then today we want to do a little bit more of discussion with you um, through Menti or feel free to open up your camera and, and microphone if you're comfortable or otherwise use the chat to share any thoughts or discussion points that you want to. So the yeah. first question we do today is number three. So it's, are you aware that the data repository providing access to your data set should make the metadata describing your data set available in formats readable by machines as well as humans? And the, the image on the Menti is just from these information boxes. Each yeah. question has an information box that brings in an element that explains it further with what does it mean? Why is it important? And how do you do it? So first, uh, use the Menti to indicate whether you are aware of this as a fair practice. So, so shall I, I show the results? Sure, yeah, I think Kim actually added another uh, option for the answer saying uncertain. Yes. Yes. But so no that's one very kind of you. We are very <laughs> dichotomous at the website, but everyone is aware. So that's great. That's amazing. Right. Um, and then so the more discussion you can have within your archive or within yourself or with your colleagues is how is this communicated to your users or your designated community? So how can researchers or other people looking to deposit data know this kind of thing about your archive? So this is, I believe, an open answer. Mm -hmm. So you can have a little think about it and fill so it. For, for, for dance, we would say it's um, in the terms and conditions that are linked on the website. That's one way. Another way is we have a provenance um, document <laughs> so one answer not sure if we communicate about it um yeah via website agreement open policy good and it's really because some interfaces of uh repositories are very to the point maybe they're based on dataverse and they're just like boom they're there but then you can still make user guides. So for instance, Soda in Belgium, they have a user guide that's linked to the same page of their data for either looking for data or, or depositing data. So, yeah. And for example, you can also, as an archive, um, promote uh, if you have a metadata harvesting protocol, so a REST API or an OAI PMH protocol. That's also something that falls under this aspect of being fair. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, if a researcher is really looking into getting, getting the most views on their data set, so, so being found by the most amount of people possible, it can be important to them that the metadata in your archive can be harvested by search engines, for example. So that may be something that they're specifically looking for to maximize the findability of their data. Yeah. All right, I think that's right. that pretty good sums it up. So then the next one we want to move on to, and there's only, I think we only focused on four. Yeah, one yeah. per letter today, yeah. One per letter, well, accessible. We asked, about question number four, are you aware that access to your data set may need to be controlled and that metadata should include license information under which the data set can be reused? So this is mainly asking about controlled access. Um, where do we limit access? Do we limit access? How do we provide access based on the restrictions of the data, sensitive data, et cetera? So. Yeah, <laughs> it's not going to be surprising today, I think. No. <laughs> All right. Well, then the, the follow up question that we have is more what kind of licenses are available at your archive? This this could be 
Oh, I see Diana said, however, an Estonia yeah. data is not licensable. So it should always be CC0 by default then. Raw data, yeah. So not uh, interpreted data, but the raw data should always be no license. Okay. Oh, that's an interesting concept. Have I hidden unhidden results? Yes, okay. So what kind of licenses? I know, so I see CC and closed contract with option to restrict teaching slash research and add prior agreements, okay. Right. So that's almost like a bespoke license that will be specifically created for that data set. And CC zero, CC by, CC restricted, CC, okay. Good. Yeah. I think when it's also good to see that um, that you do also recognize uh, closed licenses here, because I think some people get confused with fair and open, um, and they feel that if uh, closed access or closed licenses don't count as fair, uh, which they most definitely do, because fair only concerns whether you clearly communicate what's going on and what can happen with the data. So this is about accessibility, but actually also reusability. Um, and it doesn't matter if the answer is this isn't reusable, as long as it's clearly communicated that it isn't, that's still fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you're if you're at an archive, you've probably already heard the, the phrase that along the lines of as open as possible, as closed as necessary. So that is the kind of go, going principle of like, okay, there's always going to be something <laughs> and you can also make the metadata available but keep the data itself closed access so yeah and thinking about communicating this to your users or your designated community again in the um, uh, guidance text in the tool we actually link to an example from the digital curation center so that's i think it's under want to know more so it's all the way at the bottom and there's even more there. Yeah, so they have a user guide on how to license your research data. So there they have like an overview of what kind of licenses they offer. And then they guide their users through what kind of license um, is best applicable, because maybe sometimes people tend to, or researchers, which I think I've, I, I heard a bit of a discussion when I entered here about data horror stories. I think researchers often, feel that they need to be much more closed than they actually need to. Or for example, Maria, I heard you talk about informed consent, where people tend to be very strict in their informed consent when actually they could have been a lot more open with their data and it would have been very easy to facilitate. So user guides like this may help your users become more aware of uh, um, the fact that they can be more open than they thought they could which is of course great for reusability. Mm -hmm. So the third one where there's only one for I, there's only one question for I, but you know, it is a very important topic that uh, has a lot of discussion uh, groups as well in SESTA. And that's, are you aware that the metadata describing your data set should use controlled vocabularies? <laughs> There's a lot on here, including the SESTA vocabulary service that we link, and that is the main resource that we would point to for SESTA. However, some uh, repositories already have their own service. So the question is, are you aware that metadata describing your data set should use controlled vocabularies? Show the results. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. But then more important to us is the follow up question is, do you have any thoughts on controlled vocabularies? Mike is just drinking tea, like no comment. Whatsoever. Yeah. I, was, I was wondering if someone may want to speak up or use the chat for it, but we also have the mentee, of course. Not all areas have them. Oh, I know. Uh, the area that I'm trained in does not have any. We, I'm not, I'm not from social sciences, but biology is the wild west of. Uh, there's no consensus, so not always easy to use. I think it's also not always easy to inform your designated community about how to use them properly. 
um because it could turn into bad biology <laughs> so <we're so> <laughs> I know <laughs> preach <laughs> difficult to find and choose okay yeah I must yeah. say um analyzing the user statistics of of fairware so we because we don't have any personal data here we just collect the yeses and nos we see that this is by far um, the hardest thing for users to understand. So it's either they're just not aware or at the bottom of the tool, we also ask a question about which topics people found most difficult. It's always this one. So this is yeah where we say F and A are doing okay and I and R are lacking a bit. And specifically I in FAIR is always the most difficult. So then from a from a service provider perspective, you can maybe have like, like a, a bit of a think on do we make this as easy for our user base as possible? Do we clearly discuss it? Is it a known element? Or maybe you're lucky and like, nah, our user base got this and you don't have to worry about it at all. Problem with collaboration projects. I mean, yeah. And <laughs> then then we can also we we don't in this we don't drop um how to deal with multiple languages across a project and you have one archive that maybe uses one or two languages and and how does that work so different different story for a different day <laughs> but so the final question we want to ask is an R question and we we thought that this was maybe the most potentially chaotic for an archive um file formats and long-term preservation. So the question is, are you aware that your data should be deposited preferably in the file format that is open and supported by the repository for long-term preservation? So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and yeah, from a, there's, there's kind of, um, depending on the back end of your archive, you can nip this in the bud by only accepting certain file formats on upload. <laughs> and uh, But then uh, there's also a burden of conversion that falls to the archive if there's ever an issue with a file format that's being discontinued. So, which then leads to, I think our final consensus building question with you. What are some file formats that your archive will accept? Just to start a conversation there, you can do multiple submissions and, um, one one that we know has drama within it is accepting SPSS format or stat format. <laughs> um, and then either the burden of conversion on the archive or just keeping it as is. So um, we we know we bring this in willingly, but so you can you can uh, set text, yes, nice. text, CSV, <laughs> Great. doc. Word files, yeah, PDFs, even like, um, I would love to know, because I've actually not looked into this, what the open and stable audio and video formats are, because I don't know off the top of my head. I'm like, is MP4 open? I actually don't know. <laughs> so yeah. JPEG, PNG. I'm looking at, uh, so at Dunsweet, we just have a list on our website of our preferred file formats, uh, which is one way of also uh, communicating to your users what you accept. Um, all the ones in audio are things I do not recognize. <laughs> <laughs> and all the ones I do recognize are in not preferred. So oh, what are, what are the I'm, ones you don't recognize? Uh, they have BWF, MXF, Matroska, Flack. Oh, 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 that's an MSV file. That's fine. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. But yeah, I'm also very curious to, which is maybe something to put in the chat because I don't think this, this one allows for it. Do you help users convert to the right file formats upon ingest or is it something you do? Is it something you require of the depositor to, um, be better at if they come with um, an Excel file, do you ask them to transfer it to a CSV or do you do it for them? And how much trouble does it give you? <laughs> it 
So Grace says we do mostly if we can read the file. If not, they have to do it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. That sounds reasonable. Which then from a that that like also creates a back and forth between the the user and the archive, which I think is very healthy because you don't want a, a kind of archive it and forget it thing. It's it's more like, hey, you have to take the care with this data and we need the correct format. So do it. Yeah. I I know definitely some researchers who wouldn't know how to convert it and they're surprised where they're like, what do you mean? <laughs> and then they have to do some self-examination of uh, what they're doing. So Diana says University Archive has proper file format already during pre-ingest. Okay. Great. Nip it in the bud. That's great. And maybe you'd be happy to all see that the last question in this tool, which we won't necessarily handle today, but it's the one aimed at researchers and data stewards, which shows them that it's important to think about professional data curation for the long term and digital preservation. So in this introduction to fair data, we actually do urge everyone to use archives um, and to look for that and not just put it on their own website or put it in uh, in their files on the US shared university server. But this is one of the main things that we hope people will get away from learning more about FAIR. So we keep, that's why we keep recurring in, in these guidance texts, having the archive there and keep telling them, you need to look for an archive that does this for you. Um, so in that sense, we're, we're trying to educate researchers here to look for good archives so that the archives who are doing the work also get rewarded by being found and being used in that sense. All right. So back, back to just one screen. So the the take home messages that we want to relay here because like of course this is a tool that's mainly aimed at researchers but it can also be useful for you working at an archive working with users to have them be aware for what to look for in an archive almost like why you should come to your archive um, and that being fair and trustworthy is the number one choice not only because it's the reliability of your work but also related to funding requirements and, and so on and so forth. So chapter five will be coming soon <laughs> to the DACH near you. Uh, it contains more content than we've discussed today. As Micah outlined in the beginning of our talk, we've put each section to contain little nuggets of information for the reading, but also, you know, like making you think about the approach that you want to take in your new position. And then we do want to know if anyone is interested in becoming an early reader of our chapter or like a beta reader, um, because we we find that it's nearly done. We just have to make a few changes. But Mike and I either have been working at an archive for a while or we don't actually work on the archiving side of the archive that we work at. So we have no idea like what is best for you as a reader to the doc. So we'd love to have some early readership. And you can do that just by getting in touch with us. Um, technically, we're both on Twitter, <laughs> so uh, or just first name dot last name at dance punt, uh, sorry, D-A-N-S period, K-N-A-W period, N-L. I always say it in Dutch, even though I'm not Dutch.